you will hear a woman asking about membership of a society. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hi. I'd like some information about joining the International Arts Society. That's no problem. What exactly can I help you with? First of all, I'd like to know about the membership fee. Well, there are two types of membership. Can you tell me what they are? First, there is lifetime membership, which means that you can have access to all the facilities at the Society itself and all exhibitions. Plus, you can have discounts to various events at affiliated arts organisations here and abroad. And on top of that, you can use the Lifetime Members Room. How much is that type of membership? Well, the Lifetime Membership Fee is £1,537. Hmm. OK. It's rather a lot to pay in one go. Uh, what about the other membership? The ordinary membership, that's £193 per year. That sounds a bit more reasonable. Um, what does that entitle you to? You can visit the society, including the exhibitions, the library, and follow the arts programmes on weekdays during the opening times from 10am to 9pm and at the weekend between 10am and 5pm. On Saturday, if there's a special event like a lecture or restricted showing of an exhibition, then it opens until 9pm. So, what is the difference between this and the lifetime membership? In the long run, you save money as you're making a one-off payment. And you have exclusive use of the lifetime members' room. OK. Mm, what arts programmes do you run? Well... The Society has a very extensive programme to cater for all tastes. There's a series of exhibition rooms for the permanent collection of paintings, watercolours and sculpture. And then there's a new exhibition area which opened at the beginning of the year. And we run a series of courses and lectures to go with the exhibitions. Can I ask about the lectures? What is scheduled for this year? The latest list is in this leaflet. Oh, yes. That looks very good. Are all the exhibitions, etc., free if I join? Yes, everything is free. That's fair enough. I think in that case I'll join. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. I just need to take your name, address and telephone number. First, your name. Margaret Rochester. I take it that's R-O-C-H-E-S-T. 
T-E-R? Yes, that's it. And the address? It's 55 Stone Avenue. OK. Avenue. And the postcode? Mm, let's see. It's M-A-7-4-P-Q. And a daytime telephone number? Can I give you my work number? Yeah, that's fine. It's 0207-895-2220 and the extension is 6633. Can I pay by credit card? Yes, of course. Do you want to pay for the full year at one time or by monthly instalments? You pay £4 extra a month if you pay by instalments. OK. I think I'll pay by monthly instalments. Right. If you just complete this form, then we can set up the monthly payments. OK. If you just put your PIN number in the machine, I can deduct the first month's payment. Right. That's gone through. Here's your card. I now just need to take your photograph over here and then I can put it on your membership card. OK. That's it. I'll just print out your membership card. Right. Here you are. Thank you. By the way, can I bring any friends to the Society exhibitions and lectures? With the ordinary membership, we can issue a day pass once a fortnight, which allows you to bring a friend in. But you have to accompany them. Thank you. Can I go in now? Yes. You just swipe your card here. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a speech to a group of volunteers preparing for a town's anniversary celebrations. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. And now for the preparation plans for the town's 250th anniversary celebrations. We are going to follow the same system we had last year, but with a few changes to increase the party spirit. First of all, this time we are going to make the concert on the beach open to everyone without charge. This is because we have been given money by the council for the celebration and also because last year we had so many problems with keeping people out who had not paid. And on top of this, people will not have to pay for refreshments either as these are being donated. Right now, hmm, we are going to divide into four teams. The first one, the beach team, will be responsible for cleaning up the beach on the Saturday morning, picking up litter, bottles, plastic bags, wood and anything else that's lying around. Everyone is meeting at the beach shop at 8am. It's an early start, but we want to give everywhere a good thorough clean. We have had permission from the council to close the beach to get it ready for the anniversary celebration on Sunday. 
the second team will be responsible for setting out seating in the square for the speeches and prize giving. Again, an early start is preferable, but the vans with the seats can't be there until 9am, so shall we say that everyone should meet at the village hall at 9.30? Starting then will allow extra time if the vans are late. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, the third team will be the judges. For each of the various competitions, we will have three judges. On the whole, they will have had experience of judging before. There will be a boat race, a swimming competition and the best fancy dress. A cash prize will be given to the winner in each category and for the two runners-up, there will be book tokens. There is a sponsored mini-marathon, and by the deadline, lunchtime today, we had 263 applicants, with ages ranging from 15 to 60. That's 80 more than last year. Each entrant has paid a £20 registration fee to enter, and all the profits will go to the local children's hospital to help fund much-needed specialist apparatus. The fourth team consists of the wardens for the day itself. We are expecting at least 10,000 people, if last year is anything to go by. The fields near the entrance to the beach can be used as car parks, and we need wardens to help make sure the actual parking is more organised than last year, which was a mess. We also need someone to be in charge of the first aid, which will be at the entrance to the beach. Finally, we need some volunteers for the clean-up. Last year we didn't do this very well, and so the council has agreed to provide large bags to collect all the recyclable material, like glass and plastic, etc. But we have to deal with the rest, like leftover food, ourselves. We don't want to leave piles of rotten food around or dangerous bottles. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear two business studies students, Evelyn and Mark, preparing for a seminar presentation. Before you hear the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Well, I think the marketing of food would be a good topic. I read a very interesting article the other day about the Canadian food market. Hmm. I suppose everybody's interested in food, even if it's trying not to eat. Why Canada? I know that's where you come from, but isn't it just all North America, really? 
No. That's why I thought this article was interesting. Although lots of U.S. companies are well established in Canada, and vice versa, there are still subtle differences between the two markets. It says here, the Canadian market is definitely not a northern clone of the U.S. I like that. And it says that if you understand these differences, it can have a big impact on successful food marketing. So I know that Canada has a big French-speaking population in Quebec. Is this what they're referring to? Not only French and English speakers, there are many different ethnic groups in Canada. It's really quite multicultural. For example, Toronto has large Asian and Italian populations, and Vancouver's got a large Asian population too. And, because Canada's population is small, these groups make quite an impact introducing new styles of cooking. So, you can see lots of unfamiliar vegetables and things in the markets, and new restaurants are opening every day. It's great if you love trying out new foods, as many people do. Which kinds of food are becoming popular? Well, some Asian food, I'd say, has been popular for quite a while, like Chinese. But now, Southeast Asian restaurants are becoming very fashionable. Then, there's Mediterranean, of course, such as Greek, Italian, and so on. But Caribbean and Mexican food is really taking off among young people these days. So, are the supermarkets starting to stock the ingredients that are needed to prepare these foods at home? You know, all those unusual condiments and sauces. Yes, that's right. It's quite interesting going to the supermarket, isn't it? And noticing how they're introducing sections for foods of different nationalities. You can buy quite exotic products locally these days. The article mentioned that 80% of the Canadian retail market is controlled by eight major national supermarket chains, so that when they introduce changes, they can happen quite rapidly. Okay, well how are we going to organize this seminar then? I made some notes on the trends in the Canadian market, about changing tastes and also patterns for where food is consumed. I thought maybe we could summarize it into a chart or table and maybe use the overhead projector to present it. Good idea. Maybe I could have a look for similar trends and tastes in Australia and the UK for comparison. Let's have a look at what you found. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now, as the conversation continues, answer questions 26 to 30. The most significant trend, it seemed to me, was that Canadians are definitely interested in healthy food. For example, did you know that salads are the third most commonly eaten food in Canadian restaurants? Really? What about organic food then? Is that becoming more popular? Yes, it's definitely moving into the mainstream compared to a few years ago. And a recent survey showed that four out of five shoppers said that they check the fat and nutritional information on the packet when they're deciding what to buy. What other trends did you find out? There's one change I noticed straight away when I was home last year in the meat department. You know, here the meat packaging says rump steak or four-quarter chops and so on. Well, they discovered that most consumers these days didn't know what to do with these roasts and rounds and ribs. So the government approved a new naming system for cuts of meat, which is related to the required cooking technique. What a good idea. I've never really understood the difference between sirloin, rump, round and all those names. So how many new categories are there? Eight. There are three kinds of steak for grilling, for marinating and for simmering. And then there's what they call quick serve beef for stir fries I suppose. And premium oven roast, oven roast, pot roast and stewing beef. 
It's a great idea, isn't it? I hope it catches on here. I agree. Any other trends that you thought were significant? Well, what's really interesting is what the article called mobile meals. In other words, more and more Canadians are eating meals away from home, but not just eating more junk food. They're projecting a 40% increase in snack food sales over the next three years, and the growth is coming from healthy snacks. You know, the ones that have less cholesterol and fat, such as muesli bars, health food bars, and those types of products. Apparently, in the food marketing jargon, they're called nutritious portable foods, which means healthy snacks. The other major trend is that young people are doing more of the food shopping these days, so marketing has to be aimed more at them, as well as more conventionally at the mother. Thanks, Evelyn. I think we'll have an interesting discussion about these trends and the comparisons with other English-speaking countries. I'll see if I can get some information about them to compare with yours and meet you on Friday to put it together. See you then. Bye. That is the end of Section 3. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk given by Dr. Miranda James. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 35. Now, listen carefully to the talk and answer questions 31 to 35. Good afternoon everybody and welcome to the first in a series of talks we have arranged for the Overseas Students Association this semester. Dr. James has very kindly agreed to speak to us today on the topic of public speaking and judging from the large numbers of you here, it's clearly a subject of great interest and relevance. Dr. James. Hello. It's good to see so many of you here, and hopefully what I'm going to tell you will be useful to you both here at the university and in your future employment. Many people avoid speaking publicly, by which I mean in front of, say, ten or more people. Not because they lack the ability, but mainly because they lack confidence, which is really only due to lack of practice. Today, as a consequence of the influence of television, audiences expect speakers to be relatively brief and to the point, in addition to being well-informed and interesting or entertaining. Probably the most important part of public speaking is what you do beforehand, by which I mean preparation. This includes practical details such as knowing precisely what your topic is and exactly how long you are expected to talk for. You should also plan the content thoroughly. A good strategy is to write out the content as you intend to say it, and then make brief notes, preferably on small cards, which you use to talk from. This way you sound more natural. You incorporate pauses while you look at your notes, and you can then look at your audience while you are speaking. Never read your speech without looking at the audience. 
Eye contact is a very important part of communicating with an audience. So deliberately move your head and look around at your audience. Pauses are important, as most people, when they are nervous, tend to rush through their speech. Now you have some time to look at questions 36 to 40. Now listen and answer questions 36 to 40. Practice speaking slowly. This gives you more time to pronounce your words correctly. It's always easier for your audience to listen to someone whose speaking is clear and calmly paced, so that they can understand the ideas being explained. And the bigger the group, the more slowly you should speak. Remember to project your voice, speaking clearly to the person furthest away from you. It's a good idea to rehearse and record yourself. Pay attention to your intonation when you listen to yourself. It's even harder if you're speaking in a second language, I would imagine but there's nothing worse than listening to a flat, monotonous voice. So try to vary your tone and rhythm. This will add meaning to your words. Lastly, pay attention to both your posture and your gestures. A confident person stands or sits in a small group with their head up, chin out and shoulders back. Try to avoid scratching or fiddling with your hair or beard or pens, jewellery and so on. These movements can distract and irritate your audience. Yet you may be unaware of them yourself. Another reason for rehearsing, preferably with feedback from a friend or better still on video. I hope these few tips will make your experience of speaking in public a little easier. Remember, practice makes perfect. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.